All right. I think we have folks who have come back in um, from the coffee break. So we're very excited to get to the, the next panel discussion, looking at a new climate powering sustainable development uh, for all. And we, um, as we move into this session, we want to build on some of the discussions that we have had earlier and, and think about how this fits into a broader sustainable development agenda. So we will, um, a, a number of the comments that you will hear from the presenters today will reflect some of the discussions that we have had this morning and this afternoon, but looking at how we can expand out a little bit more. And we will start with um, Alex Pereira, who is the acting director of the Global Energy Program at the World Resources Institute. So Alex, I'm going to hand it over to you uh, fairly quickly. And if you would like to say anything in terms of your background as a means of introduction, feel free to say so. And if you'd like to speak from here or if you'd like to be at the podium, uh, it's up to you. Wonderful. Is this on? It is. Yes. All yep. right. Um, well, it's great to be here. Nice to see you all. Uh, my name is Alex Pereira. Uh, by way of background, do they really care what I've been doing? <laughs> um, so my background, you know, I started in um, in the energy efficiency space, actually, in deregulation in New York State, kind of thinking about how to restructure the market and in restructuring, not eliminating opportunity for efficiency in renewable energy, which was sort of a risk. Um, then I went into finance. I spent some time in uh, investment banking and public power financing. So I got some experience with um, the municipal bond markets. Um, and then, uh, let's see, back into policy, energy policy. Did a stint in entrepreneurship. I actually launched a company that makes solar-powered uh, trash compactors. You can see them around D.C. and on the National Mall. Yeah. Um, when, you think of the, when you think of trash, think of me. Um, <laughs> And then I came to WRI, and, um, and WRI, what attracted me at WRI was being part of a global platform. These issues are, are global. Uh, WRI is really at the intersection of environment and development. We're not a just environmental organization. We're not just a development organization. We kind of weave our way between the two topics and, it's, and, it's, and sort of bring it together in an important way. Uh, and that sort of guides, I think, all of the, the work that we do. Um, so that's, that's me in a nutshell. Um, so I, I guess I was asked to sort of talk about the connections between renewable energy and, and sustainability um, and, and climate, I think, was the other overarching piece. And, and just, you know, we're all aware of the challenge. Um, if you're less than 38, I'm not going to ask people to raise their hands who's 38 or not. Um, but if you're under 38, you've never lived in a less than average temperature <laughs> year. Um, two thirds of GHG emissions come from energy production and use. Uh, we've increased our energy use from 50 percent by 19, from 1990. 20 to 35 percent expansion, but over the next 15 years, and energy consumption is expected. So you know we need to do something. Something has to happen. Right, if we're gonna if we're gonna solve climate sustainability, economic development, we need a step change. Uh, now that you're all thoroughly depressed about the problem, um, there's some good news. Um, I think we've gotten into some of the economics of renewable energy earlier in the session, uh, not to be overly repetitive, but we've seen incredible declines in the cost of renewable energy. Um, you know, 80% in solar, 50% declines in wind. I mean, it's just incredible numbers. Uh, never before has the conversation been about, we're no longer talking about managing the premium of renewable energy. It's actually, hmm, there are a lot of locations where renewable energy is the least cost option. And how do we manage the integration of this resource into the grid? I think the conversation before in the previous panel touched on some of that. But this is providing incredible opportunities for consumers and economic development. Just to give you some examples, I was in India a few weeks ago and working with a large IT company. And they signed a solar deal on their car park 
at 5.7 rupees. They're paying 7 rupees per kilowatt hour for grid. So they can do solar, save money right off the bat. They're doing that for economic development, just economic reasons. Kind of makes them look good, but they're just doing it because it, it pencils out on their balance sheet. I was talking with a large uh, pulp and paper company in India again. They thought that, well, you know, coal has to be the cheapest resource for us. So we're going to do a big captive power plant for coal. Turns out coal, seven rupees per kilowatt hour. Then they started, they scratched their heads. They talked to some wind developers, six rupees per kilowatt hour. <laughs> they ripped up the business plan for coal. They're doing a large wind project. I mean, this is economics. You know, renewables are winning in more and more locations. A friend of mine just came in, he was visiting from Abu Dhabi. You know, the, the utility signed a 5.84 cent per kilowatt hour solar deal. Gas is nine cents. In Abu Dhabi, where, you know, they've not short of, no shortage of natural gas there. But again, the utility is rethinking their business plan. What kind of resources are we going to use to meet this, our growing demand? Um, even, you can point, even in Minnesota, I've got to give a U.S. example. Minnesota went with solar over natural gas. They're saving $46 million a year in NPV. So these are you know, the, the examples of where renewables are actually cheaper, um, are growing fast. Um, so there's an interesting thing has happened. You know, the consumer, the large indu commercial industrial consumer has become very aware of this. Uh, we've been working with that uh, customer segment since 2000 in a partnership called the Green Power Market Development Group. Uh, we worked with 15 leading industrial companies to explore how they can support renewable energy and access renewable energy affordably. Uh, that project supported over 1,000 megawatts of renewable energy projects in the U.S. Well, we're doing that in India now, too. And Indian companies are uh, very excited about the opportunity, really eager to work with us. We started in Bangalore. We're doing this in Chennai. Um, you know, other, other states around the country. Uh, and more, there are more and more examples of companies doing this for economic reasons. This is providing a very powerful private sector coalition to scale up consumption of renewable energy. There's a conversation earlier about the solvency of the utility. You need a solvent, financially viable utility. In India, they're not all solvent, financially viable. It's hard for them to enter into PPAs. Nobody wants to do that. They're not bankable PPAs. You have a good credit companies. They can do a PPA with a developer and actually do that, lower the borrowing cost. You get a virtuous circle. So we're really looking at models to aggregate demand from the industrial sector, scale up uh, deployment of renewables at the individual level, at the industrial park level, and finding the economics to be very powerful. And once again, this incredible alignment between the needs of the large commercial industrial companies and Modi's renewable energy target, 170 gigawatts of renewable energy, how is he going to achieve that? Um, well, we can provide a, a, a collaboration with the private sector to help achieve those goals, and that becomes very powerful. So now we have real alignment between the largest consumers and renewable energy goals and targets. So, and this is happening broadly in the U.S. I think utilities are really excited now to work and partner with their customers. We're seeing a shift in the willingness to explore the business model of how to uh, capture more of these opportunities. And regulators are looking, are really taking this seriously. They're very interested in these solutions. So, just to wrap up, where I, from where I sit, never before have we seen such incredible alignment between the technology cost, the will, the, the, um, the wants of the large, even the largest buyers, the motivations of the utilities to actually work with this, and the regulator. And I think that's going to help us really drive and get to the step change that we need, because it's open up, going to open up incredible opportunities to really scale up deployment of renewable energy in the most affordable, cost-effective way. So I'm really optimistic about the opportunities going forward, and I will stop there. Great. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much, Alex. So I think um, as you talk about the BRI's work, you talk about it in this broader development context, and, and you s make the case that renewables is, is uh, already where it's at in terms of cost efficiencies. You, you're doing this work in the Green Power Market Development Group, and, and you said, you know, I have to have a U.S. example in there. So my, my, my one question for you, as you look at this work in the U.S. and, and globally, and I, particularly in developing countries, is there anything that you are seeing from this uh, work in developing countries that we can learn from in the U.S.? Does that, does that make sense? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think um, there's sort of the, the role of the large customer. Um, they can actually have a lot of influence in driving this shift. It's something that we've been working on very closely. Um, the customer needs to be educated about the options and they need to be really pushing because when they're pushing for this, you know, the utilities don't listen to WRI. Well, they kind of do, but they don't really listen to us. They listen to their customers, mm. <laughs> you know. So if we're in India and we have, you know, the cognizance, the emphasis is the, you know, they come in and meet with a regulator, the regulator will they'll listen. Um, and so there's a great opportunity, I think, to really empower the large customer in this to be a positive force in this transition. Um, and it's really important that we find the solutions that are both win-win for the customer and the utility. Uh, it doesn't help us if we push the utility into bankruptcy. Mm -hmm. You know, to manage this transition, we need to have solvent utilities. So I think there's a great opportunity to drive that alignment between um, using the customer as sort of a force for change. Uh, so that's sort of, a, and that's a consistent piece between our work in developing countries and in the U.S. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Thank you. So now we're going to move over to Charles Rangstein, who's the Director of Energy and Extractives Practice at the World Bank. Um, and Charles, anything that you'd like to say about yourself in terms of background, context, and then your comments? So I started working at the World Bank in 1986 in what was called the Household and Renewable Energy Division. Back then, I think in the World Bank, renewable energy was a play toy. Or if you play baseball, we were like way in left field. <laughs> and then in, uh, five years later, in 1991, I hooked up with the tall gray-haired gentleman on the right, who you'll hear from later, <laughs> Mohammed El Ashri. And that, of course, was the establishment of the Global Environment Facility, the GF at the World Bank. And when you have a billion or two billion dollars in your pocket to fight climate change, things like renewable energy, well, in the World Bank, people sit up and take notice. So I think that for me has been a, a catalyst and a whole series of initiatives have now, I think, brought renewable energy into the mainstream at the World Bank. And I'll present some figures and you can tell me if I'm right or wrong on that. So if I can. You can stay there or you can come up here. Can and people sort of see through me or past me? No. So go up there. <laughs> okay. There's your answer. You're, you're right. not invisible. Um, <laughs> yeah. Thank you. So I'm clearly not going to fool anybody. Um, let me uh, just give you an overview of, of how we look at the sustainable energy challenge at the World Bank and particularly the, the place of renewable energy. I hope uh, probably earlier today you would have seen this organizing framework. Um, the World Energy Council calls it the energy trilemma. So it's the triple challenge, as we call it in the World Bank, of how do you balance needs for energy security, energy equity, which is normally translated as the access agenda, and environmental sustainability. Well, I think, let me just kind of summarize my view on this. The wind is blowing to the southeast. In other words, the driver of renewable energy is somewhat less, I believe, energy security and, and energy equity and more and more dominated by climate change considerations. It's not that those vertices on the upper left are, are not important. I mean, we've tried, others have tried to quantify what's the value of renewable energy and energy security. So if you remember Shimon Auerbach, who tragically died a few years, years ago in a plane crash, he had the concept that renewable energy was part of an energy portfolio. That if you will, just like an investor tries to optimize his mix or her mix between bonds and, and stocks or equities, you could look at renewable energy being like part of your stock portfolio. 
maybe high cost or high volatility, or actually low volatility in this case, and it would balance actually the volatility of, of fossil fuels. And he actually constructed optimal portfolios, which showed that even though renewable energy wasn't least cost, your overall outcome in terms of risk reward um, required renewable energy in the system. And people, they might not know that concept of the math, but policymakers internalize that. I think that argument is weakening with the globalization of, of energy, of interconnectivity, um, transboundary energy trade. For example, we now have a, a global glut of LNG, liquefied natural gas, and the technology of floating storage regasification units, which is making it possible for various countries to get into the LNG import business at very competitive rates. I think that trend is going to continue. So I think the argument that renewables provides energy security is weakening somewhat. I think on the energy equity side, yes, renewables is always going to have a place in meeting, I don't know, that last 15 percent or so of the population that cannot be reached by either central grids or mini grids or micro grids. And, there, and we will start seeing more and more uh, microgrids with renewables mixed in. But in volume terms, volumes of renewable energy, I don't think the, the energy equity side will be dominant. In fact, one false trade-off here is between energy equity and environmental sustainability and climate change. You can figure out that to provide the 1.2 billion people on the planet some minimum level of modern energy service, electricity, you're contributing somewhere around maybe 2 3 percent to global greenhouse gas emissions. And to me, that's a non-starter to say that we, we have to deny these people access to basic electricity because of climate change concerns. So how do we translate that organizing framework into what we're committed to? It's through sustainability, uh, sorry, sustainable energy for all, SE for all, which I'm happy to say we were a founding member. In fact, we co-chair. It's Jim Kim with Ban Ki-moon uh, on the podium there. Um, and the, you probably know the SE for All goals, uh, universal access to modern energy for all. That's not just power. That's also modern cooking, clean cooking. Um, double the rate of improvement in energy efficiency and double the renewable energy share uh, uh, in the power market. And I'm happy to say that I think the, the proof of the pudding was that you saw that sustainable development goals now, for the first time, embrace energy. The MDGs did not. So SDG 7 is basically a replica or a mirror of, of those goals. So do we walk the talk? Um, there's a snapshot of, we actually just recently closed our FY15 portfolio, but these are figures from fiscal year 14. You can see that actually hydropower at all scales, small, medium, large, is still or now is the largest chunk of our of dollars going out the door in terms of grants and loans. Uh, transmission and distribution, which is a catch-all for everything from energy efficiency on the supply side, loss reduction, integrity of, of the whole dispatch system, and grid extension for rural electrification. That's the second chunk. Various institutional and policy port, support, the third chunk. And then the so-called new and renewable energy would be coming up number four. And the fastest growing part of our portfolio, by the way. And in terms of the decomposition, well, very briefly, um, there's hydro at 54 percent of our renewable portfolio. Um, geothermal is a good chunk. We've uh, been a pioneer in mobilizing finance for um, centralized solar, CSB. Um, and then sort of a, a smattering of everything else. Solar PV is, is certainly a growing part, including for grid-connected applications. And I think the key to making all this work, it's, it's the leverage effect. So, I mean, we will never beat climate change if you, if you just depend on public resources. We're obtaining a leverage of maybe about two, two to one, three to one. Uh, our goals would be to try and get that up to something like five to one, so that for every dollar of our money going in, we're mobilizing four or five dollars of OPM, other people's money. <laughs> yeah. Now. I actually think that the significance of what we do in terms of promoting sustainable energy, it's probably less in the dollars. We're something like 3 percent of global energy finance in, in developing countries. 
Uh, it's more, if you like, the software or the, the quality of the policy advice and advisory services, analytical services. And these are some of the loci of what we think underpins successful, sustainable energy development. I mean, it's good stuff like proper lease cost planning. Increasingly, that integrates uh, externalities into that equation. Just the enabling policy, law, and regulations. Utilities that actually perform and respond to price signals and, and customer demand. Mapping of renewable energy resources. We're putting a lot of effort into mapping geothermal, solar, and wind resources. Fair and transparent competitive procurement. It's the best way to get around corruption. Um, Cost-reflective tariffs. Capacity to integrate renewables into grids, which is becoming an issue as some of our clients cross the line from about 10 or so percent renewables penetration on their grid, guess what? They have to learn a whole new science of how you balance intermittent renewables and keep your grid afloat. Um, there's a lot to learn there from countries like Germany, Denmark, the rest of OECD. Um, network pricing so that transmission tariffs reflect actual costs anywhere on the grid and you can get third-party access. Very important for renewables development. And lastly, I'll talk more of this carbon pricing as new kid on the block. Um, interesting trend. Uh, this is actually, I stole this from Bloomberg and Michael, Michael Liebrook. Uh, there's a trend actually away from feed-in tariffs, which I think played a very important role in providing mar market security and predictability. Now we see more and more countries going into more um, market-based mechanisms, like auction me mechanisms, which do imply higher administrative costs, but do have the benefit of competition to drive prices in the market down. And Alex spoke about some of the fantastic prices we've been seeing in places like South Africa or the Middle East. Um, a lot of that is just due to competition and also low cost of financing in today's market. Um, kind of what is, what is our organizing framework? Uh, I, I think we're at today a market which is still, for renewables, fundamentally policy driven. I mean, a question I get at least once a day is, Chaz, uh, oil's going for $45 a barrel. Isn't that putting renewables in the pits in your client countries? The answer is broadly no. One reason is oil, at least in the electricity market, only accounts for just a couple percent of generation. The real competition is coal and gas. Um, but, but second, in most of our client countries, it's still policies that drive the penetration of renewable energy. That is shifting, as I think Alex was also hinting, into a market that's more going to be driven by price, competition, and availability of finance. And so we're, we recognize that this is like a trade-off matrix in how we look at where we want to go with renewables, in this case, and climate change. And very briefly, on the uh, y-axis is just how do you classify a particular fuel technology combination in terms of its cost? And then on the x-axis, you go from technologies that are fundamentally low carbon to high carbon. Well, where do you want to operate? You really want to operate, of course, in the green zone, things that are cheap and climate friendly. And then the no-go zone is the bottom right, things that are like, frankly, coal most of the time, where uh, it's it's, well, not, not necessarily coal, but other technologies that would be high carbon, but also high cost. And coal would probably be in the upper, upper right. And by the way, the bank about two years ago took a position where we no longer support coal except in very unusual circumstances for countries that basically have no option. So the joke is the doors open a little bit, but we put a big German shepherd outside the door, mean one. Um, and then there are various rationales by which we can continue to support renewables even if, if it isn't least cost. Country commitment, availability of soft finance primarily. And I'll try to wrap up here. We think the new frontier in terms of addressing climate change and supporting renewables is carbon pricing, and we've been making a lot of noise about this. We have now adopted an internal price of $30 per ton CO2, and in our new projects coming up, it's not an absolute requirement, but more and more projects are having a with-without sniff test. So what's the rate of return without carbon internalized? And then how does the project look with the, the carbon, call it tax or shadow value imposed? And I think that is going to accelerate the, the magic, 
the lines crossing. This is on a levelized cost of energy basis in China. You know, you wonder why the Chinese can say their emissions are going to peak in 2030. Well, that's basically why, because, again, this is stolen from Bloomberg, but the lines are going to cross, at least on a levelized basis, and if there's enough storage, that will work in 2030, and with carbon prices, that will even accelerate or bring that day forward. So, thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much, Charles. I think it's um, good for us to have as this framework the energy trilemma. We hadn't actually quite seen it presented that way today. So I think that was a very good, good uh, point for us to um, have as a point of reference. Um, I enjoy your mobilizing other people's money. <laughs> um, I, I wanted to ask you a little bit about um, what you have been learning around the sustainable energy for all effort. And if you were to reflect back on what you know now, is there anything that you wish you knew then when you started that would have advanced that work mm. more quickly? Mm. So what have you learned now that you wish you knew when you started the Sustainable Energy for All work that would have advanced you that much quicker? You know, I suppose it depends what your goals were in framing mm -hmm. the initiative. I think many of us always recognize that the fundamental value of SE for All would be the high-level political visibility and political commitment. So I don't want to say the game, the game is over, but when we saw SDG 7 being adopted, yes, with some noise, uh, uh, some people challenging some of the specifics, but broadly it's, it's there. I mean, frankly, I shouldn't say this in public, but you could almost shut down SE for All and I would, I would be happy today that mm. we accomplished a lot just by mounting the initiative. Okay, great. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, now we're going to hear from um, Richenda Van Leeuwen, who is the Executive Director of Energy Access at the UN Foundation. So Richenda, I'll ask you to say a few words about yourself, and you can present from there or up here if you'd like. Thank you very much, and I hope we can come back, because that was a somewhat provocative uh, statement just yeah. then that I'd very much <laughs> like to take up, uh, during, up. <laughs> during the Q&A, because I'm, I'm going to try and make the case in the next 10 minutes why we should not shut down sustainable energy for all, because there's just still so much work to be done on the actual implementation of, of the SDGs. Um, anyway, my name is Richenda Van Leeuwen. Um, I have been with the UN Foundation for something over five years. Um, I founded and lead our work on energy access, um, and uh, UN Foundation has been um, a big supporter behind the scenes of the development and uh, um, working of, of sustainable energy for all. Um, uh, particularly, as, as you had said so rightly, uh, with a lot of help and support from the, I won't say white-haired man at the back of the room, but the uh, <laughs> esteemed leader at the back of the room who's really helped um, guide us uh, over these years. Um, when we set out, and, and, and before that, since other people are sort of saying what they do, I love dogs, if you don't know that about me already, I'm happy to sort of give the extracurricular piece as well. But before that, I was um, uh, focusing on uh, emerging markets, grid-tied renewables investment. So uh, six years ago, I would have given a very different um, perspective, more on the, the VC side, uh, at that time than, than I'll give today. Um, but the interesting thing has been actually trying to tie in the, the business and the social side of the equation um, as we're really looking at sustainable energy for all, as we're looking with the SDG 7. Um, in a sense, it's, it's almost a bit of a shame that we have it as, as its own goal because it does tie in so closely with the achievement of so many of the other goals as well around gender equality, around universal access to health, around education, and, and so on. So, so we really do see that, yes, it, it's terrific that it's got a goal, but it's very much intertwined. So um, next slide. Oh, I guess I'd do my own slides. Um, so when I joined UN Foundation, we, we were looking at how we could um, be effective in supporting the development of the, um, particularly of the off-grid sector, recognizing that at that time there was a sea change in the pricing of um, solar panels. We were seeing uh, storage technologies, we were seeing balancer systems, some, some pricing increases in certain aspects, but the whole package together, the pricing was, was definitely coming down, which was enabling a new opportunity for being able to deliver um, at least uh, small-scale, lower-cost renewable energy services to 
communities and households that previously um, had, had not really been able to afford it. And it wasn't really just a technology, it was really looking at the financing packages. Um, many of you probably heard earlier today, I'm sure you've talked about uh, mobile money and the ability now for the scale in terms of pay-as-you-go systems where you, you, you pay more on a rent-to-own basis or sometimes there's a sort of almost a, a micro lease um, that you may not actually as a consumer own the system. These are all very new innovations happening um, in the sector. So when we started uh, five years ago, um, we started with about 20 people, including, um, I think he's still here, Dan Schnitzer from Earthspark, uh, who's one of the great um, young entrepreneurs uh, in, in the sector, really looking at what could be the contribution from a market-led approach to driving the growth of the markets, particularly focusing on the off-grid um, solar home systems, small-scale renewables, microgrid. So really the piece that was more open to a market-driven approach or a market-led approach, rather than the grid extension, which we, we saw very much as the purview of governments. So um, fast forward uh, four and a half years later, um, we, we, and we set this up really to be a contribution to um, the work taking place on, on energy access uh, under the Sustainable Energy for All initiative and as a sister initiative to what some of you may be familiar with, which is the Global Alliance of Clean Cookstoves, which is really looking at it on the, uh, the cooking side and it is also hosted at UN Foundation. So um, over the last four years, we've, we've grown from 20 members to more than 2,000 members. Um, covering all technologies, we're technology agnostic. So, but what we do see a preponderance of solar PV. I think about 70% of our members are focusing on some type of solar PV, uh, whether it's um, the smallest uh, lighting solutions. And just last week, in fact, uh, several of the companies in the sector talked about having um, brought uh, the very entry level light, uh, solar powered lighting products now below $5. Um, so, um, in fact, one um, little sun uh, today in Dubai at the Global Off-Grid Lighting Association conference announced that they were actually producing an entry-level product at $3.50. Why do I mention that? It's not so much about are we replacing kerosene and we can go into the fact that there has been a, a big push by some countries to try and, um, in, including Kenya, to try and um, find and, and be able to produce opportunities to replace kerosene. But really, we, we as a world now have no excuse for any child um, being educated and studying at night now having to um, use kerosene um, or candles. And I did part of my MBA by candlelight in Kosovo. So I know what it's like to have the fumes, the, the, the poor quality of the lighting, and, and always the fear that, um, that your hair's going to get singed. <laughs> um, we have the solutions now. Um, it's really a question of, of how do we adopt them, how do we utilize them. And certainly there, there are those who criticize us and say, well, are you only focusing on, on these entry-level solutions? And the answer is no. You know, it's an all-of-the-above all strategy, and we're seeing that across the sector. Looking at microgrids um, where you have the interoperability so that when the grid comes, in fact, you can uh, interconnect with the grid. And, and again, um, Dan and his team have been able to put the first... Uh, uh, solar-powered microgrid in, in, in Haiti and, and, and really bless them for, for, for having taken that one on um, and now expanding from there. We also uh, see a lot of work around um, business model development and business process development. So as I mentioned, there's been a very good confluence with the rise of mobile money in certain countries for being able to pros process small-scale transactions again providing an alternative mechanism to having to get a loan from a bank and then being found perhaps not credit worthy because you're low income and it, you struggle maybe to even get in the door of the bank. We're also seeing um, that through these 2,000 members um, from 170 countries all around the world that they're delivering energy solutions to about 21 million people a year. And collectively um, from last year, uh, through their, through their lifetimes to about 230 million people. And I mention that also because when we're talking about megawatts and hundreds of millions of dollars, and I'm sure you'll hear a little bit of that from, from Melanie in, in terms of what Power Africa is doing and the large scale transactions that they are closing, and, and, and that's terrific. Um, at the same time, um, we are really needing to drive 
even basic energy access uh, as far down as we can, sort of through the last mile or the last half mile, um, to those who, who need it most but really don't have that extra income to be able to afford to pay for it twice if it doesn't work the first time for them. Um, we also work a little bit on uh, humanitarian applications of um, small-scale solar and, and renewable energy as well. Um, so um, we did a um, survey of our membership uh, over the summer, and we, we haven't produced the final results yet. We're preparing it for publication. Um, but from that, we actually, it was interesting, um, we, we just heard on, about energy equity, and I said we need equity for energy because we found that for most of these businesses, in fact, still the number one constraint for their growth is access to financing. Um, but it's not just the money per se, because I've, I've also been in those um, panels where people have said, well, we're not short of money. It's that we're short of bankable projects. And we hear the people saying, well, we're not short of bankable projects. We're short of money. It's really transacting it at the right time, in the right place, in the right way that is most useful to those companies. So we got responses from 210 member organizations reflecting and we gave it a bit of a haircut we had some outliers who said they were going to raise a billion in in the next 12 months and we said we didn't think so when their revenues were three hundred thousand dollars a year um but we we totaled up about 1.3 billion dollars in terms of existing deal flow um, within the sector from these 210 companies that had responded to us over the summer reflecting about 400 million dollars in equity needs and about 600 million in debt um, and 40% of those were working with some, some kind of mini grid, reflecting about $500 million worth of deal flow. Now, UN Foundation, we are not in the business of, of doing due diligence on deals. We leave that to investors um, who are doing that. So we can't say this is good, bad, or indifferent deal flow. We can just say it exists. It's been articulated by the companies as, as being an existing need. And it reflects um, a range of geographies, uh, not just sub-Saharan Africa, India, uh, across South and Southeast Asia, and the Caribbean um, as well. So um, I just want to close with also saying that there are some areas where the market is not yet reaching. Um, we are driving the market as far as we can because we believe that that helps with sustainability. I've seen too many age-driven approaches in the past where, um, and, 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 and others who've been in the sector for a long time will, will recall the days when solar panels or solar home systems were given away, and um, sometimes in large numbers, as in Indonesia in the late 90s. And unfortunately, the ecosystem wasn't actually developed at that time to sustain those um, interventions. What we're really seeing with the market is not sort of to say, it needs to be a profit sector, but really to drive that sustainability across the ecosystem in terms of maintenance um, and, and the technical ability to, to provide, again, for the consumer so that you're actually really serving your consumers well. We're also at UNF, um, and I'll close with this, focusing right now on the application of renewable energy solutions in healthcare settings. We see that there is a correlation. We're working with the World Health Organization to determine and try and track how close a correlation it is, but that the areas and the countries that still have low levels of access to sustainable electricity or secure electricity or sometimes any electricity also tend to be those areas that have residual high maternal mortality and neonatal mortality. So we're working also to, with a number of countries initially in sub-Saharan Africa uh, with the governments of Kenya, Uganda, sorry, of, of Ghana, Uganda, and Malawi, and now moving into Tanzania, to really and and uh, really look at um, how much of a, an issue is power um, being a hindrance to their being able to provide um, modern healthcare services into these communities through these clinics. We've um, produced national reports now for for these three countries um, and working now on one for Tanzania and then really drilling down to actually pilot some projects where we hope we can focus on a more holistic approach so it's not just about how many kilowatts are you bringing in or how many megawatts are you driving across the country but we're also looking at tying it in with um, efficient medical appliances because it's not just about the generation it's also about what you actually do with with the energy that you're generating and um, 
I've been delighted to see Power Africa focusing on uh, with Global Leap also on on efficient appliances. Um, but then we're also really looking and seeing to what extent is energy or is power um, able to help to serve as a driver for improving healthcare services. And this is a pilot. You know, we don't have the metrics. There hasn't been a whole lot of data done on this. There's a great report that was put out by the bank and WHO earlier this year that sort of seemed to th seem to um, indicate, and again on a sort of common sense basis, that that in fact there is a close alignment, um, and we'll be working this out over the next several years. And again, to close, really, to, to say that SDG 7 um, is not just about energy in and of itself, but we're really trying to look at it in terms of driving sustainable outcomes also across education, across health, across gender equity, across um, income increases as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, Richando. Um, coming from a small Caribbean island myself, I have those fond memories of studying late at night by candlelight. I, I remember them only too well. Uh, so so uh, very excited to hear more about the Energy Access Practitioner Network and the points that you raised about the interoperationality, the new business development, the humanitarian access, the access to financing, and, and sort of um, also looking at sort of the healthcare settings. So can you, could you give us a, a, a very specific example of how someone who is a member in this network has benefited from it in a very concrete way? I mean, are you looking really at, at, at surveying and getting a sense of the network and providing information? And how, how, how are members of the network really able to use that information to... Well, I'd be happy to ask Dan uh, uh, in the Q&A how, how Earthspark and how Spark Meter have benefited, but partly it's access to information. Mm -hmm. One of the things that we found early on was that we had entrepreneurs in northern Argentina delivering solar home systems and struggling and facing exactly the same issues that somebody in southern India in mm. Connecticut was facing, but they weren't aware of each other's work. They weren't aware or, or they didn't have any mechanism to interact. So mm -hmm. partly it was a way for people to interact with knowledge sharing, uh, peer learning, we do training. Um, we also do a lot of convenings where we've brought together uh, entrepreneurs um, together with governments because we do find that, again, as part of the work under Sustainable Energy for All, that in terms of government electrification plans, uh, until very recently, um, off-grid was not necessarily, and uh, microgrids were not necessarily really being included as a, as a part of the planning process in a way that reflected the activity that was already on the ground in their own countries. Mm -hmm. So in, a, in, in part, it was actually to try and have a bit of a reality check to say, this is already happening. Not that you necessarily need to regulate it. Um, you need to regulate it effectively, but not over-regulate it, although on microgrids, actually, regulation is a good thing. Um, but really to, to, to showcase what has been happening um, in this sector over the last years, as we've mentioned, driven by, by these changes. Um, and, and then we also do quite a lot of work, uh, really, um, a lot of it behind the scenes, trying to connect uh, entrepreneurs and opportunities to investors. Great. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you very much. We're now going to move on to uh, Melanie Vand, who's the Chief of Staff of Power Africa. And we have been talking about Power Africa a few times during the course of the, the day. So it's good to have you here, Melanie, to give us an update on what's happening with Power Africa. And um, if you'd like to briefly introduce yourself also, that'd be great. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. So my name is Melanie Vand. I'm the Chief of Staff for Power Africa. I've been with the initiative now for just over two years. So I've been lucky enough um, to get in early. Um, I've spent most of my career working on people power as opposed to electrical power, so uh, mostly working in global health and economic justice advocacy and organizing campaigns in the global south. Um, but really excited to be here today and, and joining this panel. Um, since Power Africa has been a topic of discussion, it sounds like throughout the day I'm hoping to use my, my brief time here trying to demystify what Power Africa is, how we work, and how it can be beneficial to a number of you in the room. Um, and would look to hear from as many of you as possible during the Q&A with, with feedback and, and questions. So I just have a couple of slides to go over some of the basics. Um, so as most of you all know, the president launched Power Africa in June of 2013. 
the initiative really speaks to a, a point that Richinda made um, in her remarks, which is this is not typical business as usual for, for the U.S. government. We're really trying to advance a new model for development where Power Africa is leveraging U.S. government resources to mobilize private sector investment. As a government employee, I wouldn't dare um, repurpose OPM um, as the Office of Personnel Management, uh, but ultimately that's what we're trying to do as well. Um, and the idea is that we're working to double access to electricity by increasing new generation capacity on the continent, as well as increasing access. So we do have those dual goals. Um, we do have a focus on, on cleaner and more renewable power, and so are working really hard with our um, host government counterparts across sub-Saharan Africa and private sector companies that are interested in wind, biomass, geothermal, solar, et cetera, um, to really increase both generation capacity and access from a large-scale perspective and a small-scale perspective. Um, one of the fundamental um, principles guiding Power Africa is one of partnership. Um, out of curiosity, curious to get a sense from the room, who here is an official Power Africa partner? I know I see a few, and I know I'm sitting up with two. Okay, great. Um, so Power Africa, um, borrowing from, from Charles's presentation, knows that we can't do it alone. So the idea is that we're really trying to help create and facilitate this ecosystem of players to get deals done, um, which typically take, as, as you all know better than I do, often many years or even decades to push through. Um, particularly on the large-scale front. And so the idea is that we're working with over 100 private sector companies who have collectively committed over $30 billion in commitments toward very specific deal flow in sub-Saharan Africa. And we work with those partners to provide them a set of tools that can help them achieve those commitments. In addition to our private sector partnerships, we also have a number of partnerships with development partners. Um, the, the biggest of which is with the World Bank, which committed $5 billion to Power Africa's initial six focus countries in West and East Africa. Um, in addition to the World Bank, we work closely with the African Development Bank, the government of Sweden, which made a very significant $1 billion commitment to Power Africa over 10 years, which we're working very closely with them to shape and, and orchestrate. Um, and the EU recently also made a, a pretty significant commitment. So the idea is, is that we're really working together to align our resources toward a common agenda. This is a just really quick slide on some of the work that we're doing to focus on access. This is not all that we're doing on access, obviously, but it's Power Africa's approach to looking at what can be done off-grid. Um, this is a sub-initiative of Power Africa. Um, and Richenda and the, the network of her practitioners have been very involved in helping to shape the thinking behind what our strategy and approach is. And there's two main pillars. One is to mobilize finance. Um, given the survey results that Richenda spoke about, there's, there's clear demand um, and a market to serve there. And then secondly, to really create the enabling environment for off-grid to take off. Um, you've heard earlier today, I think, from, from Jay Cusack, who's in the back of the room or out across boundaries, work to set up a fund that Power Africa is helping to support. It's a first loss facility. Um, that's just one example of one of the ways in which we're trying to crowd in private sector investment, particularly for smaller scale projects. Um, and I can give you additional examples of what we're doing on the regulatory side um, and the institutional capacity building that we're doing uh, to make it easier for companies to scale business models that work or enter into new markets. Um, I was just in Liberia a few weeks ago, and one of the things that we're doing there, which is a place where um, essentially only 2% of the population has access to electricity through the grid, is helping to stand up their whole rural and renewable energy agency um, so that they can have a master electrification plan, have engineers on staff, um, procurement procedures, all the things that um, a number of the panelists have talked about that we know are really crucial. Um, I know that this is a little bit hard to read, but I wanted to put up here a summary of what our toolbox looks like. Um, Power Africa recognizes that there are a lot of different obstacles to mobilizing private sector investment in order to increase generation capacity and increase access. We've been working across the U.S. government as well as with our private sector partners and our public sector partners to put together a really diverse, dynamic set of tools that can be applied 
in a number of different country contexts across the power value chain. Um, and so just really quickly to run through a few of those and highlight a couple of examples so that this becomes a little bit more clear. Um, in terms of transaction assistance, this is probably the set of tools that most people associate with the Power Africa approach. Right now, we have over 20 transaction and technical advisors who are working in sub-Saharan Africa. They are literally our boots on the ground in a number of countries. Some of them are embedded in ministries of energy, in utilities. Um, others are working independently, all tracking and accelerating deal flow. Some of it's large scale, some of it's small scale, but all playing a really um, catalytic role in trying to, to advance projects. Um, the example I'll share here is a project in Ethiopia called Corbetti. Um, that's with Reykjavik Global, where Power Africa has played the role in helping to support the government and its very first independent power producer um, agreement. And so just this July, in, in timing with the president's visit to Ethiopia, we were able to work with the project developers and, um, and investors to sign their first uh, power purchasing agreement. Uh, it's for the first 500 megawatts. Um, there's still a lot of work to do, um, but this has been in the making for many, many years. And our transaction advisor, who's an Ethiopian American, was responsible for putting together the entire framework for this deal and bringing all the, the parties involved together to negotiate the PPA and now the implementation agreement and everything else that will come with it. Um, the next set of tools also is, is something that people pay a whole lot of attention to. I think when Power Africa launched, the assumption was that a bunch of U.S. government employees in suits would be coming with suitcases. That's not really how it works. Um, <laughs> but we do have a number of financing tools on the debt and the equity side um, that can be used um, for both small and large-scale projects. Um, we're doing significant work in providing technical assistance to governments to improve the legal and regulatory framework that can attract and sustain the private sector investment we're looking to mobilize. The one example I'll cite there, um, and this is something that Alex was talking about earlier, is we help countries integrate more renewables. They have to figure out how to manage those with their grid. So in Kenya, for instance, we've been working with them through a grid support program to essentially redesign their entire grid code um, so that they can absorb all the solar and wind that the country is trying to bring on. Um, that falls along with a lot of the capacity building work that we're doing and, and legal assistance. Um, so this is a, an example of just all the different types of tools that Power Africa is trying to bring to bear. We're, we're working on additional tools as well um, and eager to, to work with those in the public and private sector to deploy them. Um, I was asked to talk a little bit about um, Power Africa and Health. I know Richenda touched on it a bit, um, so I won't go too into the details there, but just to say, um, actually under Alan Eisendrath, who you heard from earlier today, his team had a project called Powering Health that was really trying to build up the knowledge base for how do you sustainably electrify health infrastructure. Despite billions and billions of investment in the health sector, the majority of health facilities in Sub-Saharan Africa have no access to electricity. And um, I have a couple of just snapshots from the website that Powering Health put together based on their research and their investments in a couple of countries that I think are just some really helpful tools for groups that are looking to get more engaged in this space. Um, so these are a number of topics that Powering Health put together really helpful and accessible resources for, um, and two tools that, that Powering Health produced, um, both with practitioners and, and providers in mind. Um, so I'll stop there and, and just welcome any questions or feedback about Power Africa to date. I'm looking forward to learning more about what you're interested in. Thank you very much, Melanie. I was, I was quite pleased to hear you talk about Powering Health, because that was going to be my question. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, the degree to which Power Africa has been able to, to mainstream some of your work across the different USAID portfolios, which we know is always a challenge in the USAID context. But, but because you gave us a hint of that, I'm going to ask a slightly different question. And, and you talked about all who have come to the table to provide resources 
resources for Power Africa. And you said we are working to align our resources to a common agenda. Is this the greatest challenge that you're facing in Power Africa? How do you get all who's come to the table to be on the same page about how that money is being spent? Is that a fair question? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, I think that the SDG for energy provides a very useful organizing principle. Um, I think in most cases, we're really quite aligned in what we're trying to fund and how we're trying to fund it and where partners aren't trying to elbow each other out from the table they're all sitting at at a country level, it works. Um, so much of this ends up actually really being personality driven. Um, and I think the more that we can be working at a headquarters level and at a country level um, to really align the work um, and build those partnerships, the better. Um, it, you know, we, don't, we certainly don't want to be working across purposes. Um, I will say that you know, there are still gaps in, in the Power Africa partnership and, and certainly more resources to be mobilized. And I think we're trying to, now that we're two years in, identify what those gaps are and, and how we can work together with all of our partners to address those. Excellent. Thank you. So I think there's a lot to talk about here. Let's open it up um, and I'll take several questions at, at the same time. Once again, as my colleagues come to you with the microphone, please give your name and your affiliation and get quickly to your question. So let's start with you, please. Hello, thank you. Uh, my name is Alejandro Lara, uh, pursuing the studies at Georgetown right now. Um, just referring very much uh, to uh, early December, the first two weeks in December in Paris. Uh, perhaps if you uh, ask around, uh, as soon as you ask Paris, uh, if, if you ask me, I, I would refer, oh, it's glamorous. I, ref I link Paris to romance, <laughs> perhaps love. I guess where I'm going is, um, exactly, uh, the thing is, uh, what are you, each one of you, expecting out of those meetings specifically, and what is the, uh, the, 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 you know, the action plan after those meetings? Because it, it seems like sometimes when people meet uh, uh, globally, there is not much uh, other than talking, but not walking the talk, as was mentioned earlier. Okay, great, thank you. Yes, please, uh, the lady right here, yes. Hi, my name's Claire O'Connor, and I'm here out of interest as a private citizen. Um, my question was gonna be about the biggest gaps that you faced. Um, I think it's great to celebrate the success, and there has been so much success. But as Michael Eckhart this morning said, we're 40 years into a 100 year transition, to a clean energy economy. So I think we need to face what, what still needs to be done. And specifically, he also mentioned one gap was, according to him, there was no country in the world that has a public policy or a law for off-grid. And he, he identified that as an urgent need. So I wonder if you think that's correct and what each of you are doing in your organizations to address that gap. Thank Great. you. Great, somebody's been taking careful notes. All right, yes, please, Benjamin, up front here. Yes? Thank you. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, my name is uh, John Mosheim, and I work for a company called GHG Engineering. And uh, my question was kind of a little bit related, but in another orbit, and it's about transportation. Uh, sustainable, renewable transportation, which seems to be kind of stuck in traffic, so to speak. <laughs> um, so I just wanted to hear any comments uh, regarding uh, okay, that Okay, thank part. you. Yes, uh, uh, okay, let's go just across there. Yes, thank you. Yeah, and I guess building on the last couple questions, um, I mean, we've talked a lot about opportunities and threats today. What was interesting is nobody had mentioned natural gas and what they think the role of natural gas will be. Is it complementary? Is it a threat? And and how do you view the role of gas and and do you see policy changes that are needed there? Great, thank you. Yes, uh, if we can go to the back and then we'll come to the front. 
So, yeah, and Benjamin, if you could get that. Hi, my name is Liza Herb, and I'm, I'm representing Equitable Origin. Um, my question is about how your respective organizations are thinking about understanding and approaching the social impact of large-scale renewable energy development, as well as best practices. Um, I think we're all in agreement about the, the benefits, the, both the human and environmental benefits of access to energy, and the economics and politics seem to be in alignment to ramp up these efforts, which is wonderful, and this is where all of the talking points have kind of focused today. But as investment in renewable energy mega projects continue to expand and projects transition from paper to practice. How are you thinking about proactive approaches to community analysis, engaging communities in meaningful ways, and reducing social and other non-technical risks, Great. particularly in areas with environments with um, weak regulatory um, regulations like land rights, et cetera, regulatory capacity at will? Excellent. Thank you. Yes, please. Hi, my name is Alexandra Towns. I work for Catholic Relief Services. Uh, my question is for all of you, but perhaps most in particular, uh, Richenda, what do you see the role of NGOs in renewable energy? Um, we worked on a brief pilot project this past year with Delight in Kenya, working with private um, service providers in developing a business model to market solar lanterns to some of the women involved in our um, community savings groups as just a small example, but we're interested in, in more opportunities and more examples of what NGOs could bring to the table. Excellent. All right, we'll take a, uh, three more. Yes, please. I'm Bob Hershey, I'm a consultant. Uh, what is being done to use the internet to try and get some transparency and get the funding collected locally for what people want to do? Excellent. Thank you. Yes, please. Hi, my name is Ibi Ronke, and um, my question is, you mentioned off-grid focus, but then also clean cooking fuels, and I was wondering um, what the, I guess, the collaboration between the two, because I did do a project that talked about, like, the wood cooking stoves and then um, health, the negative health effects. So I'm wondering, is there a focus on, like, natural gas, um, okay. more efficient wood stoves? Great. Thank you. And I think we have one more here. Yes? Thank you. I'm Robert Foster with Winrock International. I had a question about utilities. Uh, we're starting to see resistance in the U.S. from some of the utilities recently, Arizona, Florida, right now proposals in Texas, New Mexico by utilities to charge a fee for anybody who goes on grid. 99% of PV is on grid nowadays. Uh, and we see people dragging their feet like in Kenya to do net metering. How do we address this? Great, thank you. It's a great set of questions, guys. <laughs> Melanie, we're going to start with you. Um, and you could address any of the questions that we like. So what can we hope to get out of Paris apart from romance and love? <laughs> what are some of the biggest gaps that we're seeing based on our discussions today? We've talked a lot about successes. How do we get transportation out of traffic? How do we move uh, beyond that? What are the opportunities for, for natural gas? How do we address social impact issues, particularly for communities that have weak regulatory structures and access to justice questions? What are the role of NGOs? How are you engaging the NGO community, the civil community? What is the connection between leveraging the internet for transparency? What are the connections between clean cooking and off-grid connections? and how do we deal with um, utilities and fees for going on the grid? So which one of those uh, would you like to address? <laughs> I thought you had to do all of them. Ah, <laughs> you were hoping. <laughs> I, was, I was seriously taking notes to make sure I tried to catch them all. Well, I could maybe try to speak to two or three just to enable the, the whole panel to engage with, with the crowd um, who asked some really interesting questions. So the, the first one I'll speak to is natural gas. Power Africa does work on, on gas projects, and there are a couple of reasons why. One is um, in a lot of these countries, gas is available, and often um, these are new um, new technologies for the governments to figure out how to manage, how to manage well, how to manage on a commercial basis in a way that is going to be as environmentally sustainable as possible. Um, and so... Um, particularly in Nigeria, Ghana, Tanzania, and a few other places, we, we are engaged in gas, but never without engaging on the regulatory and legal environment 
for, for how to best manage the sector. So in Ghana, for instance, we're working with the government to help them develop and implement a gas master action plan um, in a way to, to help ensure that the government is able to, um, as responsibly as possible, manage their own resources, recognizing what a critical role gas can play in that particular economy and in West Africa regionally. Um, the other, the other question I'll pick up on is um, the community question that came from the back. Um, so I would say that this is an area where Power Africa is actually looking to do more and learn from groups that have engaged on this. And so would welcome talking with you afterward. Um, but you know, each agency that's involved in Power Africa has its own rules about how um, it takes a look at environmental and social safeguard requirements. So there isn't one Power Africa policy per se because each agency is different. Um, that being said, we're looking to adopt best practices and have a checklist that we put our transactions through before we determine whether or not a project becomes eligible for U.S. government assistance or the title of being a Power Africa project. Um, so we just welcome more conversation with you. <laughs> well, I will let Mohammed take on Paris uh, in his closing remarks. What I will say, though, is is I think, you know, a lot of the dating has been done already, so maybe we can actually enjoy the romance in Paris. I mean, I think <laughs> some of some of the biggest some of the biggest signals have already been sent by uh, countries like the U.S. and China really taking on on the emissions um, very visibly in in a very significant way. So so I think some of you know some of that heavy lifting has has already been done. Some of those signals are being sent. Um, um, Alex, I think it was who had mentioned at Abu Dhabi. I was in Abu Dhabi three weeks ago when the UAE was announcing its its uh, uh, INDC, um, its in, intended nationally determined uh, uh, commitment. Um, Contribution. Contribution. Thank you very much. Um, and, uh, and 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 the fact is, you know, for a big oil and gas country to to really be stepping up and and saying, no, we we recognise we we have to work on this, we have to do uh, take action on this. I think I think is significant. So as I say, I'll leave it to to, to Mohammed to wrap it all in um, uh, together and, and and see where we come out with that. But uh, uh, for one, I'm going to be in, trying to enjoy the romance in Paris. Um, um, in terms of 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 uh, I'll take on the the, uh, the the question by by CRS and, and also a little bit on the clean cooking. Um, the role of NGOs in in renewable energy. Well, UN Foundation is an NGO, so hopefully you've heard a little bit about what we as an NGO are doing. Um, I would say that there there are many different roles. Um, on the one hand, you've heard about how many of us are working to try and develop more of a, a robust market. Um, we have seen the the value of nonprofit groups that have been priming the pump for that market. So for example, in East Africa, um, Solar Aid uh, has been the largest single um, uh, NGO effectively helping to create new distribution channels for accessing um, previously unreached communities and households with um, their sort of first foray into the market of, of purchasing a small scale renewable energy solution. So that has been done um, on a nonprofit basis as a market enabler, as a market builder. One of the things that we find, which is that companies that are uh, the sort of the pioneers in their particular market um, don't necessarily have the capitalization to take on all of the acquisition of the new consumers. So, so in terms of that market building, that initial outreach, um, a subsidy, whether that's a subsidy to the company or by, by doing it through a partnership with an NGO can be extremely helpful and extremely effective. So that's that's one area. I mean, I think there's all the usual work as well in terms of of um, helping helping to support the, the sort of the analytical side. Um, Practical action out of the UK has been a, a partner with the bank and, and and ourselves and others in sustainable energy for all in helping to develop um, what has become the global tracking framework of really looking at the five levels of of access as sort of a tiered a tiered approach to access. So there's that analytical side as well. Um, on the humanitarian side, I would say it's it's primarily um, the purview of, of UN agency actors like UNHCR and others that we're working with, but also very much the the frontline development uh, uh, NGOs that are the first responders often during um, during any kind of emergency. So 
We've been working with UNHCR and with the Global Alliance of Clean Cookstoves on an initiative called SAFE, which is a safe access to fuel and energy, which is really looking at helping to promote the use of small-scale renewables as well as cooking solutions during humanitarian emergencies. And we've worked with a, a lot of NGOs, um, particularly after uh, Typhoon Haiyan in the Philippines and then more recently this year after the earthquake in Nepal, um, again, because that's where the market has been disrupted and sometimes will come back quickly and sometimes will not come back uh, for a long time. Um, in terms of off-grid and clean cooking, unfortunately, the, the 1.1 billion people and the 2.9 billion people who don't have access to um, improved stoves and fuels are often the same the same people. So, you know, we're, we're counting often the same household that has both issues. So it's both they don't have electricity and they're, they're facing issues with, with cooking. Um, I can't really speak uh, to exactly um, the, the sort of the latest of the Global Alliance of Clean Cook Stoves, but they've really been trying to focus on helping to improve the range of options available to consumers. Um, in India, I've, I've been in households where, in fact, they're using three, four, maybe even five different approaches to cooking, depending on um, uh, the, the lowest cost, which is the, the traditional three ring fire with, with wood. Maybe if they can afford it, they have some sort of a rocket stove which we are seeing now that there are significant improvements in terms of things like forced updraft, but you, you kind of get what you pay for. Um, there, is, there is a trade-off between cost um, and efficiency and the effectiveness in terms of the reduction of the emissions uh, and actually getting that health benefit. And the low-cost stoves um, will be more efficient, so they're good in terms of lowering the household expenditure on wood, but they're not necessarily providing the health benefit that we would hope um, to be able to get in terms of the, the smoke and, and the emissions. LPG is certainly being adopted very widely. Um, again, where it's affordable, uh, the canisters are still unaffordable to many people in, in the lower income households. Um, and we're seeing, I mean, you know, there are, there are those who are uh, promoting solar cooking. We, we see it has a, a, a place, it's not a panacea. Um, there's some good ex examples of uh, institutional um, solar cooking um, uh, technologies that are working quite well. So there's no sort of silver bullet, but um, we really are seeing again that the trying to develop a sustainable market for a lot of these and, and then really improving both on the technology side, on the dissemination side, and then on the education side, because um, three million women and children die prematurely because of the effects of, of smoke from both cooking and kerosene lighting um, every year. And many of them are not even aware that the smoke is, is, is actually bad for their health. So there's an educational component as well, really trying to look at how we can provide the opportunities so that you have the choice um, to adopt a different technology um, so that you can also make that behavior change as well. Thank you. Charles? I'm going to try and take on four of the questions. First on uh, Romantic Paris. Look, I've been following the climate change negotiations since INC 8, before there was a climate change convention. For the first time, I have a sense of optimism about way, where the negotiations are going, because I th see three things coming together. First, in the language of the convention, the industrialized countries shall take the lead. I think we're finally starting to see some leadership, including from the likes of, as you mentioned, the United States and China. Uh, second, I think uh, we're seeing what we call in the language of diplomacy a commitment to commit on the part of developing countries, and that's very important. And then thirdly, I think the basic architecture, the idea that there's this voluntary club, I mean, that's what it is, of countries who are going to commit, and then over time in this process is going to outlast the lives of my kids, that there's going to be a ratcheting up series of commitments and an enlargement of the club and I think that's eventually how we'll get there. Um, the question about no country in the world has a public policy on off-grid. That may be true, but there's three key policies. Okay, yeah. well, I don't care. I mean, what I look for is that there's a couple of key policies that they do implement. One is what I would call anti-monopoly, or giving particularly private operators a license to operate. If you want to set up your own mini-grid in Indonesia, good luck. PLN has a monopoly. The regulations just don't allow it. Uh, second, a rational tariff and subsidy policy on electrification. Many countries have a policy of equalized tariffs no matter what you, where you are. 
doesn't really make sense. I mean, unfortunately, people who live in high-cost places will have to pay more. Maybe you give, still give them the equivalent of a lifeline tariff, but by putting a flat tariff, you are eliminating the possibility of renewable energy finding its own natural comparative market. And thirdly, transparent planning. Nothing kills private initiative than the desire of business plan to set up shop in some corner of a country which is unelectrified, and then having a politician declare that telling the utility to run a line out there because they want to, let's say, buy favor of votes, and that just kills the business. Natural gas, I think it's a very important transition fuel. What's interesting, if you look at most climate and energy models, no matter what price you put on carbon, natural gas is like the fulcrum, okay? So coal goes up and down, renewables go up and down, but natural gas is pretty much in there. Um, I think natural gas is renewables friendly. It's, there's only a couple ways to provide it sufficient flexibility on the grid these days. Until battery storage is really cheap, you basically have hydropower or fast responding gas turbines. Lastly, on the intersection between clean cooking and electrification, really important question. My old graduate advisor, Kirk Smith from UC Berkeley, um, has raised a lot of questions. I mean, yes, you can create clean stoves, but to get far enough down the emissions knee to really make an impact on the, our figures, four and a half million people who die from air pollution, from cooking, you really need to have very sophisticated stoves that currently cost like $125 a copy, way beyond what the beneficiaries can pay. So he's raised, should we be promoting induction cooking? Because after all, that is a smokeless technology, at least at least in the locality where indoor air pollution takes place. Great. Thank yeah. you. Alex? Great. Um, first of all, great set of questions. You guys should be up here. With this. <laughs> um, I'll start with, uh, I'm going to go from the, I'm going to work from the bottom up. Um, so utilities, resistance to change, um, you know, this, this comes down to, you know, if you're an electric utility and a customer owns a solar system and they want to connect into your grid, they're putting power back on. I mean, there, what is the, there should be a, a payment. I mean, we, don't, we have to work that out. I don't, I don't have the, the answer exactly, but uh, if you're using grid as the backup, you know, there should be a fair payment for that. And yes, utilities are getting resistant to it. Well, that's kind of a, we're sort of victims of our success. We're now at the point where this is material for utilities. <laughs> so it's actually a good thing that utilities are now resistant. Now we have to figure out how to do the integration and how to make this work. And I think, you know, in Arizona that maybe that's not the model that we're all going to follow, but um, we do have to think about this and be smart about the, the regulation. Um, that's why in our work with, with the buyers, you know, we're working in regulated states and the utility, we're saying, look, you know, utility, you can own the stuff and you can put it where it makes sense for you. Um, and then that's going to be the most affordable option for us. And if the utility owns it, they become very motivated to work with our customers because they can, you know, kind of come up with creative ways to put in their rate base. So there are ways of kind of getting around this resistance, and we just have to be – but, yeah, I mean, it's something we have to continue thinking through. I mean, this is, it's a new era. Um, on the uh, – what else was I going to take on? Role of natural gas. I think natural gas isn't automatically – renewables friendly. It can be. I think that um, and if you are financing natural gas plants and they are incentivized to generate as much power as they can, then they're going to be competing with renewables. If you can finance them, if there's different mechanisms to give them value for capacity, voltage support, ancillary services, uh, what are the different models to finance a gas plant so that it actually has an incentive to back up renewables, then it can become very renewables friendly. So I think natural gas is a transition. We have to get that right to make natural gas a transition <laughs> because it, it could just be a competitor. Um, the role of NGOs, so I mean WRI, we, we are also an NGO, um, but we have a, a, a practice, our electricity governance initiative that has worked with uh, civil society groups in country uh, to provide them tools to build their capacity to engage in the planning process. And that's very powerful because 
civil society groups don't know the entry point into the planning process. So if we can help build their capacity, make them more effective at engaging in the planning process so that it's open and transparent, there's a huge role for them to play in making the planning process transparent. I mean, that's the big challenge is, you know, your, your big entrepreneurs are making investments based on plans that are really a black box. <laughs> so um, there's a great role for NGOs. Um, let's see. Um, on the, oh, you know, the social impact of large-scale renewable energy. This is actually overlooked by a lot of the sector. <laughs> Uh, they assume, oh, this community is going to love my solar plant. They're going to love my wind project. And then they result a huge resistance. Um, and you really have to, I mean, developers just have to be smarter about engaging early with the community. And, you know, how do we make this work? What are their concerns? Are there wildlife concerns? Are there, um, you know, you really have to get into that and then find out the way to address. But if the community feels like they have input, you know, there's usually a way to work around it, but the biggest mistake you can make, and I've seen this, uh, you know, in the U.S. a lot, a lot of great examples of miserable failures. Let me talk about failure, and just the failure to engage with the community, and that adds millions of dollars in financing costs as a result. Um, the last thing is on on Paris. You know, I love Paris. I've spent a lot of time there growing up, and um, it's a wonderful city. Um, you know, my view is that, you know, talking to the, in India, you know, they say the view is, oh, let's get past Paris and get to implementation. And, you know, the INDCs, WRI has an analysis showing that the INDCs or the, you know, the country commitments that are being made in Paris actually are resulting in some pretty significant renewable energy targets. Um, so we kind of think, you know, Paris is sort of, well, high level global negotiation who cares well it actually you need both you need the top down political commitment and then there are groups like us who come january when people wake up from their hangover after eating too many steak frites and beaujolais uh, we'll be there with solutions and i think that's really important you have to have the groups who are going to be ready on january 1 or january 2nd maybe <laughs> with the solutions in country to start implementing because that's when we have to roll up our sleeves and, and get to work Great, thank you. So uh, please join me in thanking Alex, Charles, Richenda, and Melanie. A great, great discussion. Thank you. So I'm going to um, ask Mohammed to, to come up shortly, but I'd, I'd like to just tee this up a little for, for Mohammed and just to do a very quick reflection on, on where we are now as we ask Mohammed to, to think about what this means for, for the future. I think we started this morning with our discussion of where we are. You know, part of, of, of where we are now, we said that we have sort of 60 years to go. We talked about cost efficiencies and, and um, the economic competitiveness and, and price parity of renewable energy. We sort of had an overview of what's happening globally, um, geographically, where the market is moving, and what were the opportunities uh, to build on that. In, in part of that discussion, I think we talked about how do you move from the big grid to a small scale, and what are some of the bridging technologies that are important. And then we also sort of reflected on data, data on renewable energy, that's dynamic. We looked at modeling and data storage and, and, and what this means in terms of access to that information to different, set of, of different sets of audiences and stakeholders. So that was a very good assessment and overview of sort of where we are. We sort of build on that then to talk about, okay, so what's next? What does this mean in terms of the building blocks and how do we get to scale? We heard about USAID 6 big building blocks, you know, competitive procurement, and we talked a little bit perhaps about cost recovery, um, dovetailing with that. We talked about smart incentives. We talked about concentrated resource zones, effective grid integration, climate planning, and innovative financing. We sort of built on that framework that USAID has to talk a little bit about questions around location versus price. How do we examine that in that context? We looked 
at other building blocks in the context of smart cities. We talked about unbundling components of a grid to get to different price points and how we think about that. We talked about data for decision making for different stakeholders and we talked about the enabling environment for investment and we saw that these were additional components to these building blocks that we needed to take into account. That led us into a discussion on a number of issues to me that seemed to focus on governance, development and transparency. We had a number of examples of new business development, how you know we talked about moving to an off-grid safari lodge to looking at how do you deal with the largest retail mall in East Africa? How are you operating at those different scales? We heard of the example of how do you get into a country like Rwanda and, and the legal negotiating position and how do you move to financing a project where you're able to move quickly? We talked about decentralizing power. How can people make their own choices and what this meant for looking at possibly a new model for development. If we're looking at this in the context of a USAID and collaboration with a, a Power Africa. In that context, we looked at the role of utilities and we, we sort of had this spectrum where we said, you know, you're looking at this hardened grid to a postmodern grid. And what does this mean in the context of reliability, sustainability, and affordability? So that then had us think a little bit more about the enabling frameworks and integrated resource planning. So we had a really good set of points and, and discussion around that, which then brought up the questions of the challenges. What are the challenges that we are facing for scaling up? We, we, you know, we looked at this from a geographic perspective. We said, you know, India, it's the financial challenges. You look at it from a regional block. How do you talk about Latin? in America, in the Caribbean, or Africa? How can they get to have a regional perspective? How do we look at the incentive structure for solar on Caribbean islands, for example? What were the challenges inherent of that? Um, there was some discussion of lack of policy for off-grid. I'm not sure that we all agree on that, but, but some discussion around that. And then looking at what are the risks for investors coming in, and we saw that some of the major your risks are political, exchange rates, and regulatory. So how do we do that in the context of, ass of assessing a country's readiness for energy efficiency? And I think this took us to a place where we are looking to the future, where uh, one of our speakers talked about this in the terms of the era of ideas is over. I don't know if we agree with that, but, but interesting to hear that we've talked about what we're doing, where are the innovations, the innovations around mobile money, pay-as-you-go system, solar home systems, large-scale, mini and micro-grids, pre-grid extensions. We talked about yield co as a model. We talked about residential solar, connections to the grid, uti utility scale school, uh, solar. So a lot of, of opportunities and ideas and how can we concretely learn? What's happening in the community around this? How is this being leveraged with a sustainable energy for all effort, with a Power Africa effort, with the SDGs, with a green power market development group work? How does that fit into that overall context? And how do we mobilize through networks like the Energy Access Practitioner Network? So I think as we, we t reflect on our discussion today, Mohammed is going to take us to another Another level and think about where we go next for the future. So, Mohammed, just to recap, that's a little bit of where we've been today, and we're looking forward to hearing from you about where we potentially could go next. Many of us know him well, Mohammed Al Ashri, is a senior fellow at the UN Foundation, facilitator for global learning for climate action, former CEO and chairman of the Global Environmental Facility. Mohammed, it's an honor to have you here, and I'd like to invite you up to uh, hear your vision for where we go next on renewable energy. I think I'm going to sit. Okay. Those are my knees. Perfect. Okay. All right. And those be at the same level. Okay. Excellent. Okay. How about here?
Okay. Well, thank you very much, Roger, for the introduction. It is a pleasure for me to be back, actually, at the Wilson Center. About seven years ago, Jessica Matthews, who used to be a colleague at WRI and uh, was at the time president of the Carnegie uh, Endowment, uh, and I were invited seven years ago before Copenhagen to talk about what kind of an agreement, just like the gentleman who asked about Paris, that would come out of Copenhagen. Well, of course, we all know what happened in Copenhagen, and now we are very much hopeful that uh, Paris will be the launch pad for a new and effective uh, climate change agreement. I'm truly proud, and I don't know whether you guys have done it you know, on purpose or it was by accident, that three of the four panelists belong to organizations that I have been or still <laughs> am associated <laughs> with. The World Resources Institute, uh, with Alex, Rishenda, and the UN Foundation, and Charles, of course, and the GF and the World Bank uh, in general. <laughs> Sorry, Melanie, but I can say that we had actually uh, joint funding of projects by USAID and the GEF back then. So there is a relationship of some kind, but it was not the same as the others. So. Okay, so what, what I'm going to do is that I'm going to uh, give uh, a global view of the future of renewable energy uh, as I see it. Uh, some of the points that I'll make you will recognize from earlier remarks made by panelists or even in the day as Roger was summing up. Uh, I have prepared the remarks because it's the only way I can stay within the allotted time and cover the points that I want to cover. So bear with me. So let me say that the world has entered a new energy era marked by concerns over energy security, climate change, and universal access to modern energy services. The current energy path, as we all know, is not compatible with sustainable development. Carbon dioxide from energy production and use represents about 65%. Charles said two thirds, that's IEA, it's about the same, just rounding to 65% of global emissions. And under current policies is estimated to increase by a third by 2020. The IEA estimates the global demand for energy will increase by 35% by 2030, with developing countries accounting for almost 90% of this increase. In my view, renewable energy holds the promise for a low-carbon energy world, and in turn, energy security, climate change, and universal access to modern energy services would be the three key drivers of a bright future for renewable energy. A decade ago, the future of renewable energy looked very different than it does today. No one imagined then that 70% of new power capacity added in Europe would be renewable, which is what happened in 2011. No one imagined that China would go from a minor player to global leader in just six years or that developing countries would become home to more than one-third of global wind power capacity. Over the past decade, the evolution of policies, technologies, and markets for renewable energy has been simply remarkable. Global investment in renewable energy capacity reached a record 320 billion in 2011, compared to just 40 billion in 2004 and it exceeded investment in fossil fuel and nuclear power combined. According to N21s, you did not hear, maybe you saw the bio I have been associated from Rent, with N21 from the beginning, so you're going to hear reference to statistics from N21. Uh, and if you're not familiar with the global renewables global status report, you really should get your hands on it. It comes out every year with the most up-to-date data on uh, investments, technologies, and uh, policies as well. So, according to REN21, 2015 Renewables Global Status Report, 
By the end of 2014, wind power capacity increased eightfold, and solar PV capacity increased 48-fold from 2004. At least 164 countries now have renewable energy targets, and 145 countries have renewable energy support policies, resulting in renewables becoming an estimated 27.7% of the world's power generating capacity. Global new investment in renewable power and fuels, including hydropower, increased worldwide 17% over 2013 to $301 billion, more than twice that of investment in fossil fuel power capacity. And continuing the trend of renewables outpacing fossil fuels in net investment for the fifth year in a row. Investment in developing countries, this is very interesting. Investment in developing countries was $131.3 billion, up 36% from 2013, and coming the closest ever to surpassing the investment total for developed countries, which reached $138.9 billion in 2014, up only 3% from 2013. As usual, of course, China accounted for the biggest share of developing country investment, or about 63%. Additionally, markets, manufacturing, and investment expanded further across the developing world, clearly illustrating that renewables are no longer dependent upon a few rich countries. The presumption that economic growth inevitably leads to a rapid increase in CO2 Emissions is fading fast. According to REN21, again, the increased uptake in renewable energy helped the world achieve a sustainable development milestone for the first time in four decades. The world economy grew 3% in 2014 without associated rise in CO2 emissions. The decoupling of economic and CO2 emissions growth was due in large part, again, to China's increased use of renewables. Affordable, clean, and secure energy is essential for improving national economic productivity, enhancing the quality of life, protecting the environment, and ensuring national security. Long-term measures to safeguard national security, my first driver, strive to reduce dependence on imported fuels by reducing demand through conservation and by developing domestic sources of energy. What once seemed a dream is becoming a reality. With renewable energy, the world can now glimpse the prospect of an economy largely dependent on abundant, domestic, and affordable clean energy. The transition to a low-carbon economy is already occurring. Counties, states, cities, and companies are taking action partly out of concern about climate change but also because such actions are in their own economic and security interest. And I think Alex may have touched upon that. One recent survey found that investments in low carbon renewable technologies generate a positive return of 33%. Moving to climate change, the fifth synthesis report of the IPCC shows more clearly than ever that climate impacts are unfolding around the world. They are affecting every continent and ocean, posing immediate and growing risks, particularly to developing countries. According to the report, and I quote, the risks of climate change are so profound that they could stall or even reverse generations of progress against poverty and hunger if greenhouse gas emissions continue at a runaway pace, end quote. Climate change, the second driver, once considered an issue for a distant future, has now moved firmly into the present, as several of the panelists indicated earlier. Climate impacts would become substantially worse, of course, unless CO2 emissions are brought under control in a timely fashion in order to keep temperature rise this century. And I have not heard that in the summary. Uh, in order to keep the temperature rise this century to under two degrees Celsius, as the international community agreed in Cancun, in 2010. The evidence as the IPC presented it is clear. Sticking to business as usual will lead to temperature rises three to five degrees Celsius above pre-industrial level. 
leading to catastrophic effects on water resources and agricultural productivity, and accelerating ocean acidity and sea level rise. The poorest people in the world who had virtually no responsibility in causing climate change will be the biggest victims as climate change intensifies. Last year, the Asian Development Bank, the ADB, issued a comprehensive report on the economic costs of climate change in South Asia. The report predicts that the impacts of climate change are likely to result in huge economic, social, economic, social and environmental damage in six countries with 1.46 billion people, a third of them living in poverty. These are Bangladesh, Bhutan, India, the Maldives, Nepal, and Sri Lanka. The cuts in GDP in the six countries will be so deep that they might ripple around the world. Keeping global temperature increase below two degrees Celsius will require new patterns of investment and transformation into a low carbon economy. Such a transformation would entail tripling the share of global energy generated by low carbon energy sources. Electricity generation would go from the current 30% or so, I said 27.7 earlier, but that's with the new renewables, but about 30% use of low carbon sources to 80% by 2050. With today's main low carbon sources, nuclear and hydro, unlikely to grow much, that would require a vastly bigger share from wind and solar. As the world approaches a crucial juncture for climate action, the next climate change deal is due to be agreed, of course, in December in Paris. The key to global action is for countries to identify policy and technological solutions that reduce emissions while maintaining energy security and economic growth. And I think that's what the INDCs have really been. And uh, experience over the last decade has shown that renewable energy can contribute a great deal to balancing these objectives of economic growth and energy security. Clearly, based on national pledges, the INDCs, an agreement in Paris will not solve the climate change problem completely or help us reach the two degrees Celsius target. But it will be a key step for collective action and will provide impetus for long-term investment in clean energy. Renewable power also plays a significant role in achieving universal access to modern energy services, the third driver. In fact, renewable energy is the cheapest alternative for providing such access. I'm sure you're all familiar now with the Sustainable Energy for All, or CEFA, initiative, and its three linked objectives. In fact, one of the slides that Charles showed had the three objectives of uh, CEFA. So I will not elaborate, but would like to take this opportunity to pay tribute to Kanda Yumkela, its first chief executive, who led a worldwide awareness effort about CEFA, which has resulted in the designation of energy as SDG 7. SDG 7 calls for ensuring access to affordable, reliable, sustainable, and modern energy for all. This, of course, is in recognition that energy, finally, recognition, finally, that, that energy, especially clean energy, is key to achieving progress on many of the other SDGs, ranging from health to education and from economic growth to climate action. The global transition to a low carbon economy, which I believe is underway, is not without challenges. In particular, fossil fuels, according to the IEA, are reaping $550 billion a year in subsidies and are holding back bigger investments in clean energy. There are many other challenges. I'm just choosing, choosing this as a major uh, challenge for renewable energy. Oil, coal, and natural gas are receiving more than four times the $120 billion provided in incentives for renewables. Apart from environmental concerns, inequality would also be reduced by phasing out fossil fuel subsidies. The IMF reports that only 7% of fuel subsidies in poor countries go to the bottom 20% of households, 7%. 
while 43% end up with the richest 20%. I just saw an item on the news before I came that Saudi Arabia finally has started to think seriously about phasing some of the subsidies that they have out because, of course, of the huge budget deficit as a result of the reduced price of oil. So let's hope that that would be uh, an, an impetus for the region and for the oil-producing countries to do. Besides policy, which has driven most of the accomplished accomplishments in the renewable energy sector so far, large-scale private investment is crucial to the acceleration of renewable energy deployment. Doubling by 2020 and eventually quadrupling, clean energy finance cannot be provided through public and development assistance alone. The leading providers of capital for clean energy projects today are commercial banks, energy, national and multilateral development banks, and electric utilities. These sources alone will not be sufficient to double clean energy investment by 2020. Utilities are under strain, and commercial banks, because of Basel III regulations, are increasingly unable to provide long-term project finance. It is generally agreed that the largest potential sources of additional finance are institutional investors, such as pension funds, insurance companies, foundations, endowments, and sovereign wealth funds. Private capital is more likely to flow towards clean energy investment when public policies and incentives make it commercially attractive by shifting the risk return ratio and supporting the liquidity and transparency of the clean energy market. Limited but, but valuable public funds must be used for leveraging, for building a strong enabling environment in emerging markets, and for risk mitigation. There is also good news on the private finance front. The market for green bonds is booming, and while multilateral development banks like the World Bank were the first movers, private sector companies have recently started to tap the market in a big way. Bloomberg New Energy Finance estimates a potential clean energy project bond market of $142 billion by 2020, with bond issuances of 18 to 40 billion annually. In closing, as the global population grows from 7 billion to almost 9 billion by 2040, and as the number of middle class consumers increases by 3 billion over the next 20 years, the demand for resources will rise exponentially. Critical to securing a sustainable, affordable, and climate-friendly future for this generation and many to come is the ability of individuals and institutions to affect change in the way we generate and use energy. It is only by significant scaling up of renewable energy that we will enter a virtuous circle, cycle of cost reductions followed by more significant scaling up. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mohammed. I think that's sort of a perfect conclusion. Um, I think you brought together so many of the elements that we talked about, but some other dimensions that we didn't really have an opportunity to get to. And I, I, I like very much your points around sort of mobilizing uh, private funding and pension funds. So thank you. Um, an excellent Pleasure. way for us to end. So please uh, join me again in thanking uh, Mohammed and our panelists throughout the day. I uh, would also like to thank you. Many of you have stayed with us for the entire day, and I know that's a big commitment to be able to give up your day um, to be with us. The discussion has been recorded and will be video archived. You're able to come back to it. The discussion and the PowerPoints uh, of, will be available on our, our blog post, newsecuritybeat.org. We will be producing a summary of the discussion that we have had today, so that will also be accessible to you. We couldn't have convened today without a lot of support and collaboration with our colleagues at the Office of uh, Global Climate Change at USAID, and I'd like 
to mention a few of them in particular who have worked with us to bring together today's panel. I'd like to, to recognize Alan Ezendrad, who many of you uh, know and, and uh, moderated one of our panels today. Catherine Stratos. Catherine, she's still here? Yeah. Oh, she just stepped out, Catherine, Eric Hawkshausen, Kristen Madler, and of course the communications team. So thank you very much to our colleagues at, at USAID. Uh, you know, pulling together an event like this at the Wilson Center um, is very much a team effort. I'd like in particular to recognize my colleague Lauren hutzer uh, Lauren, who did a lot of the work in pulling this together. Also, my other colleagues, Francesca Cameron, Benjamin Dillis, Skylar Null, and Deep Shri uh, Maturis, and also Megan Parker. So thank you very much uh, to the team. And we hope that you will uh, visit the new security beat, have a look at the discussion, and continue to come back and engage with us here at the Wilson Center as we move forward um, and, and look at what's happening with Paris and, and beyond. So thank you very much. Okay. Well, thank you for inviting me. Would you be able to find this